Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, great to see so many joining. Um, and I guess it's uh, that's the advantage about virtual meetings that in uh, in time of social distancing we can still have online community or at least virtual community. So good to see so many of you here. Um, first of all, before we start, I want to say that um, we are recording this. Um, so should you not be comfortable um, with your picture appearing in the in the video, then keep it um, switched off. And um, of course, um, it it would make sense if we didn't have um, lots of time for discussion and interaction. So please feel um, encouraged to to contribute as, as much as you as much as you like after um, Joschka's uh, short input. But um, that um, being said, um, I'm really happy that uh, Joschka Kirk has uh, taken the time to join us today. Um, he's a researcher and activist um, who's currently based in Vienna. And in his uh, research, he focuses or he explores um, how and if so at all um, and in what ways um, the theater of the oppressed can contribute to socio-ecological transformations. Um, and what he's particularly trying to is to live his, his lives as activist, um, as researcher, um, as, as artist, not as uh, different identities, but as one. So we're particularly curious and keen to know about how you managed to intersect this, Joschka. Um, and yeah, please go ahead and tell us about the intersections of scholarship, uh, theater and activism. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me, Julia, and uh, thanks for organizing this. I feel it is even more real when we do virtual dialogue, when the universities, universities are closed and everyone is sitting at home <laughs> doing their research at home. Um, so um, I just give you a short outline of what I try to, to achieve today is um, first I will just give a very short introduction to the PhD project that I'm currently researching, researching on so that you know in which context I'm doing all this. Um, then I will um, uh, talk about intersections of theater of the oppressed, which is my artistic home and activist home, kind of, and participatory action research of the South, and how theater of the oppressed itself is already a way of decolonizing knowledge and how it is transgressing dominant dichotomies in knowledge production. Um, and then I will uh, go back to my actual research and uh, focus on the question how, in, how TO is actually used in the research. And I give an example from my own research and the methodology of performative autoethnography. And in the end, I will give you an, a short uh, intro to the participatory action research, which is part of my project and how it has changed throughout the project. Um, yeah, and I, I hope that all of you could introduce themselves before we actually start and we can have a real dialogue, but I think that the time frame is a bit too short for that. But when you have questions or anything, just take the time to just uh, also dialogue with what I'm saying and, and tell us what you are doing. And let's try to generate some new knowledge together today. So um, I have I have for a long time seen these identities of um, researcher, activist, and, and artist as, as uh, maybe not combinable because I thought, okay, if I write something, uh, it's only written and it has, has no effect on reality, or if I, so it, it cannot jump off the page. Um, or if I, if I do theater, it will not have activist reality like in the way that theater can actually influence and change reality and um, in my research diary i wrote uh, unlearning the privilege of the research as a loss uh, following spivak means in this context to see the specific potentials of embodied practice as a loss that cannot be compensated in written text and i have become a bit skeptical that this is true and i will um, instead of asking 
if we can do it, I, 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 I rather ask how we can really impact society as research and theater makers. Um, so, and reflecting on that, maybe um, if we're asking always for yes, no, like can it or is it possible? Uh, we will get always a, an, an absolute answer, a yes or no answer. But if we're asking how, we'll always get incomplete answers because the, there is a pluriverse, and this makes it decolonial, um, pluriverse of different answers that are possible. So in my project, um, I tried to research um, what are the contributions of theater of depressed in, in the socio-ecological transformation. Um, facing climate collapse and all these things. And I've conducted narrative interviews with more than 15 practitioners at Muktadara, which is the biggest festival of the Ethiopia Breast in 2018. Um, and at the same time, throughout the whole research process, I have conducted outdoor ethnographic research and I will come to that later what it means. It also was conceptualized from the beginning as a participatory action research so that I actually try to see the contributions that it can have in the reality and that we can make systematization from how it can work by actually doing something in the field of theory of repressed. Um, just to say a few words on theory of repressed, it's uh, probably the widest used applied political theater technique worldwide and its main the technique is foreign theater where we play a short play like a one act of 20 minutes and then uh, which shows a social problem and shows the implications of structural uh, domination in the best case. Um, where in, and in the end, people can try to come up on stage and change the play. So uh, one basic premise is that change is actually possible. Mm. And I will explain later more on the premises of TO when, when we come to it as a practice of decolonial knowledge. Mm. Yeah, at the moment I'm writing my theory chapters in the um, in the PhD project, so I'm uh, framing the ecological crisis around the Anthropocene, Anthropocene and, and the question, who are the oppressors and the oppressed in the ecological crisis? So I, I'm going to try to decolonize the, the Anthropocene, check the question if it's not rather a capitalist scene, so it's a, a capitalistic problem, or if it's a Manthropocene, so it, it's also a patriarchal question. Um, Haraway and Moore and so many others have written about it. Um, then I will have a chapter about spiritual activism, which will introduce the colonial and anarchistic political thinkers who thought activism in a radically different way than conventional activism, mainstream activism, um, in the face of oneness, which means we are all in, on the same planet and have actually the same identity. Um, and and in the face of that, we don't know what to do, and we are still activists. So how can we deal with the fact that we are, we are, we don't know the answer to this ecological crisis? Mm. And then uh, the last, oh, I forgot the, the chapter on theater of depressed. Of course, I will, I will write one. Um, and the last uh, theory chapter will be on um, on being a researcher in the Anthropocene. So I ask myself the question: What does it mean to be a social science researcher? activist artist in in the face of apocalypse and, and ecological collapse. Um, and this is what I'm going to talk about today mostly. Um, yeah. So um, the first thing I want to talk about is theater of depressed and the participatory action research in of the South. Um, and uh, it has been very well researched by Birgit Pritsch, who is one of the um, um, outstanding practitioners of theater of repress. She also lives here in Austria. Um, and um, defining action research, she says that the researcher is acknowledging that he or she is living in a world of oppression and is dedicating their life to social change. And uh, this not doing to fight the rich or the oppressors but to establish new kinds of relationship doing the research. And the goal is to establish subject to subject relationships, the humanization of humanity, the democratization of relationships, goal oriented research and re rejection of the expert status. So the researcher is not an expert anymore on, on what, they, what 
he or she is doing. And so the people are no data or material. Um, so, and the, an important premise of it is, of course, also that theory on its own is not sufficient. It has to prove itself in practice and in action. Um, and to to parallel theory of depressed and uh, participatory action research of the South, actually. Um, she um, introduces uh, the research of Orlando Falls Border as a Colombian sociologist, um, working mainly in the 17th and 80s, but publishing also later. And, and they posed the question like in the, in the context of Latin America in the 17th and 80s, which is also the origins of Theory of Depressed, how can we change the reality as researchers? And um, he conceptualizes humans and researchers as sentipensantes, so people who are feeling and thinking at the same time, feeling and thinking beings, um, which is, of course, a super interesting concept when we are talking about theater as knowledge. Um, and, and a quote from his is that artists can do research and researchers can be artists. So that particularly shaped my understanding as a researcher, activist, scholar. Uh, research activist artist. Um, and it also is a reason why I actually make art ethnography as a methodology in my research. So putting myself as a feeling and thinking being in the in the as a material of, of scientific data. Um, so the self-understanding in this participatory action research of the South is that um, we are the research is not is always not only a political positioning but a way of life like corruption and organic intellectuals. Mm, and the, the ones who commit to theory of the press and action research or, or action research, uh, according to this um, premise is that are the ones that are changed most by it. So I am the one who's changing the most by doing this research. And actually uh, this was one of the, the foremost motivations of me starting this research actually that basically I was, um, I was burning out as as a person and and activist and and I I wanted to find out deeper about how can we sustainably change that. Mm. So, in theory of depressed and participatory action research, the facilitator becomes less and less important in the course of the process. So, uh, we are doing projects with people that are inviting us. Invite communities are inviting us to. To, uh, to make a research or a, a theater project. And in the course of that, we are first maybe facilitating more, but less and less, and communities take over their own projects. Mm. So uh, Birgit Fritz says that an, an outstanding example in theater of depressed uh, is China Sanskriti, which is the biggest theater movement in the world, basically with 40,000 members in India, where, which is where also the festival happened, where I conducted my interviews. And, and she says that um, this, um, this community, this movement is uh, functioning according to the principles of the participatory action research of the South. Um, and go, coming now to the second point is how the present actually uh, transgressing dominant uh, dichotomies in knowledge production. Um, which is like the second part, how theater of the press is actually decolonizing it. So um, it rejects the notion that knowledge is only mind-based, but it is one of praxis. Like the body knows something. The the we act not only as as brains, but we act as whole human beings. And uh, often we play everyday scenes and images in our theater workshops or plays that signify oppression. And that actually uh, poses automatically the question of praxis beyond mere theorizing. The premise is we can't come closer to understanding oppression than in mirroring our everyday lives. Like we, we play what actually is the oppression and we see that it's real and then we try to change it. Mm -hmm. Then uh, another point in decolonizing knowledge through theater of the press is maybe that marginalized communities use the O as a way of uh, conscientization in the Freudian sense about their own reality and oppression that they're facing and using it as a mode of political resistance. Um, 
at the same time as being a mode of investigation and developing expertise. Um, because um, Theatre du Press basically says that everyone is theatre and everyone is expert. So it is at the same time against expertism and at the same time it's creating its own experts in theatre, in life, in political activism, in research. Uh, examples for these uh, communities are uh, like small scale farmers in India or the MST movement in Brazil that are using theatre du Press for this cause. Um, then an important fact about that it creates dialogue instead of monologue. So it's for the democratization of knowledge. Um, one Indian unionist, unionist said in, in India when, we, when I conducted interviews there, said that when he used Forum Theatre the first time, it changed totally the way how the unionist meetings happened. In the, before that, it was only one person who spoke at the same time only one person who told the truth to everybody at the meeting. And now it's a hundred people that speak at the same meeting. And it's, um, it's uh, and actually that he said in the context of what actually changed yourself the most in through theater of the press. So he said, I was changed the most by seeing that now a hundred people have their say. Um, and it, this automatically, like if we create dialogue instead of monologue, this ex automatically um, allows multiple truths and perspectives uh, to coexist next to each other. But at the same time, the oppressed is still partisan. So it stands at the side of the oppressed or it is by the oppressed and it is not taking the perspective of the oppressor. So even though we, we see that there are many perspectives on the same topic, the oppressed always takes the stance of, of the oppressed. This is why it's called of the oppressed or not for the oppressed. Mm. And then, of course, the, the question of embodied and emotional knowledge. Um, so TO actually actively claims a place for emotions and how oppression shapes bodies as knowledge, as something that is valuable to know and as a decolonial effort. Um, the, the images and scenes that we are playing are per se containing multiple truths because one image might be uh, something for the one person and a totally different or even the opposite for another person. So images are always polysemic, they mean several things. And this creates relational knowledge instead of absolute truth. That is, can, be, can be seen by an independent observer. Mm. I want to make a short this, uh, excurse on how TO is used in social science uh, projects. So, um, there are different ways in which theory of Trapeza has been used in research projects by social science researchers. And one is that uh, they made photos of the images that they were playing in theater workshops. And these images were given headings or captured cap headlines for what does the image mean. And these headlines are used in a grounded theory way. So they are coding actually what participants have been saying about uh, headlines uh, and images. Or they interpret, for example, the photos of the workshop images. Um, best this uh, interpretation is done by the participants themselves, uh, but sometimes it's also done by the researchers. So uh, using example giving image semiotics uh, as a method to interpret this. Okay. Um, so, um, the second part of the talk um, will be about the author ethnographic methods um, that I found uh, is they, they were generated by the Pragmatic School of Sociology of the University of Chicago around Norman Denson and Spru. Um, and they actually used um, theater of the oppressed um, methods basically to create their own research methods. Um, and one of these products is uh, performative autonography, which I'm trying also to use. So basically you are writing a drama script from your from researching your own self. Um, and, um, and that can be performed instead of giving a scientific pre presentation as I'm now doing, and they would just go on stage in an academic conference and make a theater performance out of it. 
Mm. And um, they even um, write research articles that are plays. So where even Freire and Boal have a dialogue with each other. Mm. Um, and what they are searching is transgressive scholarships of the body with the heart. Um, and um, when you read the text, um, I will give you a literature list later, you will see how close it can come to a, a, a theater of the oppressed uh, thing. And so this, um, this is how theater of the oppressed actually finds a way back into the research. And I'm very happy that I can include it into my project. Um, in this autoethnography, uh, in a decolonial way, they are trying uh, to unsettle the eye uh, of the researcher um, that is in, in any case representing the other. And this should be done with equal commitment. So uh, to create a willful embodiment of we, they call it, um, um, transgressing the, the colonial concept, concepts of individual subjectivity and and us and them. Um, yeah. And the goal of this is that um, we create a, a social science and social theory that is one of hope, one of, uh, they call it a critical pedagogy of possibilities where issues of power and privilege are rewritten in an improvisation of hope. Um, And and this makes it, or, or this is one of the one of the challenges that I'm I'm facing as a research, researcher, and I guess um, you would you would face the same. Uh, are you daring to put a theater text into your PhD project and just publish a theater text and claim that it's research? Because the academic uh, mainstream will probably not accept it and call it fiction or call it something else, but not research. And, and every day I have to deal with myself how much I go on the way of what a, a, a good PhD project can look like. <laughs> what can I dare to do? Um, and um, another aspect that I think is uh, important is that, especially if we are talking about white, white male researchers like me, um, um, showing how self-reflexive you are, showing how good you have uh, internalized decolonial thinking, but rather uh, Spruce says that we should move ourselves into a space of practice vulnerability. So we actually, we actually show ourselves vulnerable in our research show how we are complicit with the structures of domination that we are living in and that it's not about being perfect in this world because that is not possible um but rather try to search for this this utopia of hope that it's possible that we can do it somehow else but also acknowledging okay this is how we are now and i brought you a short ex excerpt from uh the first autoethnography I was recording uh, when I was in the airport to India before I actually started the research. And you will see that it's, uh, it's totally complicit with all these colonial um, traveling uh, images. So I am here at the airport in Vienna and it's going to actually start the adventure to India, the adventure what I mean, what is an adventure? But I start the research and it's interesting to fly actually to do this thing. It's really crazy. Actually, I don't know, I don't fly. And what is the fight, flight for the climate? And, and I will need to redo this kind of thing when I already arrived in India, but there are so many things that were on my mind before starting this. Example giving this, how do I interact with my research partners that don't necessarily reply? All the projections I have been, I have when the people don't reply and it's very strange. But I'm looking forward and I think I got the plan that is in, in enhancing everyone's, everyone's doing in TO and theater of the oppressed 
and we'll see what happens to our this research project. I think it has the potential to really, but the to put the TO community closer together and at the same time innovate theater to press for the 21st century. I mean, this is really a good thing to say. Maybe I have to be more humble, more relaxed about all this kind of thing because humble is actually at the center of the work. And whenever I talk to the Jonas and Scritti people, it makes me so much humble. And, and, and I, then I think that TO's contribution also is to bring beauty to the world and a world that is so wasteful and in the global state of destroying. And yeah, so it's planting a tree when everything is going down. But you have to plant trees anyway. We'll see. So this is for the first journal entry. So you can see how in this text that I, uh, I produced as a supposedly reflexive researcher, there are so many colonial uh, uh, reproductions of stereotypes. And uh, also this um, imagination that with one research, we can actually change the whole world, all of it. And we can change the image of the repressed and blah, blah, blah. So this uh, image of the uh, uh, all powerful male researcher is definitely there. Um, so in the, in the further research, this kind of pieces of text will be combined to a, to a new script that is part of the book. Mm. So um, what Spru is also saying is that autoethnography, just because it's about using yourself as a material of research, um, is not an individualistic endeavor, but it shows a society in that we live in through the body of a researcher. So um, I show my vulnerability and my woundedness by showing all the world how I reproduce all this shit, um, but also that I'm just living in it and I cannot avoid it. Um, yeah, and, and this makes so much things visible about our society. Mm. And um, in some ways, this uh, short extract from the autonography also um, made visible already some potential difficulties that I faced in the participatory action research, which is now the third part that I'm going to talk about. Um, so the initial idea was uh, that I'm invited by Jonas and Scruti, the Indian theater movement, to research, research this connection of theater to press and climate and ecological crisis because before I actually wrote the expose, they wrote emails of how the ecological crisis facing their everyday lives and what we can do as global artists together. Um, and they always call for a united front of theater to press activists. Um, so I guess that we are somehow research partners in this and uh, I never got really replies onto my emails for weeks because they are also very busy and there are so many, many things that happen. Um, and when I arrived in India at the festival and I actually thought, yeah, now we, now we, we actually uh, a dialogue on how we can do it um, and, and what are the demands that they, they have as a community to, to do about the, to go about the project. Uh, it suddenly, I suddenly realized that they have no interest at all in the research and, and also in action research. So I had to make a new plan. Um, and, and I wrote here that in some way, the problem of this participatory action research was that I wanted to make a perfect, perfect, perfect decolonial research. Um, so uh, show, like showing in my research that I want, I'm so super self-reflective researcher and I wanted to make a perfect uh, domination free research or project mm. and just following all important steps that the colonial research guides will give you um, and one line that I always said a lot was I want to serve the movement and that and and what does that mean so when I was there I changed um, I changed the 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 scope of interviews actually to global practitioners who were guests at the same time. So I um, made, uh, I, hello, <laughs> my flatmate is coming home. Um, so um, so I changed that 
from one specific TO movement, which is in India, uh, um, which is in India, um, to the to the global TO movement, which is practiced in more, more than 90 countries. And still, the question was, who can invite me now? Uh, because there is no one coordinating that, and uh, it's more like a fragmented, anarchistic, rhizomatic structure. This TO movement, and I I asked myself, yeah, how can how can who can invite me and uh, um, and I failed to find someone who can invite me to actually do a participatory action research in the way that I outlined it before that where the most important thing is that I'm invited to a community um, so in the end, I asked myself the question, if I am a practitioner of theater to press and I'm part of this movement, can I just not invite myself? Um, and because the festival was frustrating my beliefs in an existing global movement and the belief that an all, all encompassing TO movement will exist anytime soon, uh, when I came back, I actually uh, got a call from a friend and who said, yeah, we're having this festival this year in Slovenia. Don't you want to do something about climate change? And I was like, yes, this is my topic. And so now uh, my action research started from uh, change from I am invited to do something to an actually action like building a, a theater of your press network resolving about around climate justice, which is called resilient revolt. And uh, now I have the feeling that I'm not doing the research alone anymore because there are so many people who influence what resilient revolt is doing, what it, are its goals, what are the next steps, what is a collective vision. And um, I finally have an idea that. Uh, it doesn't, my extra research does not depend on what I want anymore, but what a community wants. Yeah. Mm. So, um, the last uh, short ideas that I want to drop and that we might discuss together is maybe, um, maybe some ideas about the question how the research project is intertwined with the reality, how the jumping, it is jumping off the stage. Um, so one idea is that the reality actually determines what is realistically possible in the framework of a PhD or a research project. So you make adaptations because of a reality and the, uh, this makes research a process that is undergoing change within the research process. And your job as a researcher is to uh, sketch that process in, in whatever you write. Um, and the re reality also humiliates the ambitions of the research, as I've shown before. Mm. And the research is not happening somewhere in the ivory tower, but in a world that someone wants to research. It research, like, I research from within a reality, and um, the starting point is practice, experience, and lived world. So the idea that science can jump off a stage is challenged also by the fact that reality is influencing the research and that research is also happening within the world. Um, but when I talk about the actions that or the, the, the effects that, had, that, that are the result of my research, then I can say that I made new relationships and friendships. There is a new network that emerged with people that I love. <laughs> that is sustainably working somehow and um, probably beyond the time frame of the research. Um, and also that uh, I myself as a researcher have lost this goal of I want to be remembered in eternity for what I'm doing, this very male thing and this absolute change. Um, and uh, always I had this feeling that I'm not doing enough in the face of ecological crisis or in the face of whatever structural crisis we are facing. Um, and this has been significantly altered to a consciousness that I and we are doing a lot of things. And to name it that we are doing a lot of things uh, can, can be acknowledging. And uh, again, I don't want to measure if I have an effect on reality, but how. Um, so I can say that I have personally developed a new consciousness for sustainable activism. And I, I got an, an embodied feeling, actually, of what it feels if a project is resilient or not. 
and it, this has been active burnout prevention. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, then another question, question that I posed in the call for this talk was how do we perceive our impact on society? Um, and I, I want to say that, that I try to have a healing effect on it, Some, somehow mending, mending our world together again, make it livable, more livable again and again. Uh, also that feeling of smallness and, and being humble, um, and that we have a small impact actually is, is an impact. Mm. And at the same time, we can be as humble as we want. It's still empowering to see the concrete actions that we take that I see the network that is evolving. I see everything and the every, every action that is emerging from an initial research question. And uh, I can see through the theater project that we are conducting now, how research activism artists shapes the world without expecting the impossible. Mm. Yeah. And the last question would be, uh, oh, there's some. There. Oh, I can read your chat now. Wow, OK. <laughs> uh, one minute to finish it up. Um, so uh, how does the research transgress colonial patriarchal extractivist forms of knowledge production? This is maybe something that I want to pose to you as participants as a initial discussion question. But in my case, I would say it has put the male white researcher into his place. Um, and um, uh, one idea that I actually had when uh, I was conducting or that, that is emerging now when I read the transcripts of my interview is that I um, um, co-create the work with peers. So um, on the one hand, I have read a lot of research literature from the people I interviewed, so they I'm not the only author of the book that is going to come out, but also I will use the interview statements as as truth and not as, as empiric material. So uh, I will construct probably a narrative that is probably in the form of a play uh, where different people talk with each other in my research and they uh, they they talk as experts and not not as, not as someone that I comment on. Um, my only work would be to systematize and and uh, make make maybe topics from the different uh, quotes. So um, yeah, I think we can finish off. <laughs> I think yeah you have given us uh, thanks for this yeah I mean really rich bunch of uh, lots of different aspects and I think you've given us lots and lots of food for thought and discussion um, so I think yeah I think it's time to um, to discuss and interact um, just basically just in the spirit of what you what you just outlined um, so I would yeah please welcome invite everyone to um, connect to dialogue, as Joschka said in the beginning. Um, maybe see how what what Joschka has outlined connects to to your own work, to your own um, maybe also struggles, um, or pose any question. So please. I will post the literature list now for everyone. So that you yes, have. I've already said um, or, yeah. or like that. Or I'll be able to send it around. But this is even better. Yes. So please um, feel free um, to just uh, join the, the conversation. You can unmute yourself um, and just speak with us. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, feel free to put some thought or comment in the chat box and we'll be able to pick it up. Don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe Joschka, I'd start off. I'd, I'd be really curious to know whether um, you have actually, um, you know, tried this thing with performing at the conference. Um, I'd love that. Um, <laughs> but have you any experience with that? And uh, because I imagine this, you know, very traditional mainstream conferences where everyone would really fall off their chairs, 
if someone started performing their paper. Um, and I think this is uh, what a lot of conferences actually need. <laughs> so, um, but I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Okay, uh, I think that I have not yet a, a ready-made script uh, that that, <laughs> that is compiled to be performed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not at a lot of conferences, but maybe at the degrowth conference we will see yeah. <laughs> some, some improvisations. Yeah, no, not yet happened. It was the first uh, public presentation of, of some of my private recordings today. <laughs> I think it would work right, but also maybe connected thought because you also spoke of the um, moving into the space of vulnerabilities. Um, and I was wondering whether again this this is something that you can um, maybe dare doing or maybe dare moving into precisely because you are this uh, white male, presumably rather privileged um, person, and you do not face um lots of intersectional um discriminations that you know that might hinder you or that you even you know you don't actually want that um vulnerable space especially if i think of um lots of academic spaces where it's mainly about the survival of the fittest where you um, make sure not to show any any kind of vulnerability at all mm -hmm. Yeah, of course, I think it's it's maybe even more because of, of, of a male uprising, more more difficult to show the emotions on, on a, even on a science stage, whatever stage. Um, especially because if I stage autoethnographic material, I really perform as myself. And when we do theater video press, often we take roles. So I, I take a character and that's much more easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say the vulnerability when we talk about intersectional oppressions uh, lies in a different place when I'm a white male researcher and in almost every category I would fall into the category of the oppressor. Um, I think that it's actually about showing how you actually do cruel things as an oppressor or you you, this is how you show your vulnerability, whereas uh, um, not marginalized actors would, would have their vulnerability in a very different place, maybe. Um, yeah. And then, then we face the question of, do we want to re-traumatize people or do we want to, yeah, of course it's a question. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, Tamis Pru, the autoethnographer says that uh, we should never be safe with the autonography. We should uh, always have questions about research ethics at any point, while performing, while writing it, while recording anything, while making any notes. We should never be safe. <laughs> and I think that is a good uh, um, uh, uh, premise to do it. We can always be the asshole. <laughs> okay, I've, I've, uh, I've seen Su Ming, uh, but there was a question first from uh, Mina here if I say it correctly, um, who's asking, how do you relate to the essence of subjectivity in your research uh, with the theater of the press? And um, I would like to know what detailed narrative do you want to establish in this unconventional period? Mm -hmm. um, first, the last part, what detailed narrative do I want to establish? So I made it kind of easy for me. I will have um, three periods of time in, within my research that I want to make out ethnographic scripts on. One is the festival in India. Uh, then I was in Kassel for a so, um, conference, Bildung macht Zukunft, and I was participating as a participant in a theater to press workshop. And it was really a um, challenging experience in many ways. Um, so I will focus on that in, in one part, and I will focus on the resilient revolt part, uh, with what happened after we founded resilient revolt. And it will have the, its place, like uh, the, the festival in India will come after the introduction and the castle experience will come after the theory part of the, of the text. And so it has already a kind of a structure. Um, and when I write theory or when I write the empirics, of course, I will also um, 
include my vulnerabilities, but it will not be a ready-made script. Um, how do you relate to the essence of subjectivity in your research with the interview press? Mm. That's a difficult one. <laughs> um, um, one one friend in India uh, sang a song, and the, and the basic meaning of the of this Hindi song was um, that the the whole universe is contained in my being, and I think uh, we we oscillate between different uh, states of subjectivity. Sometimes I'm very eye focused, and sometimes I'm very oneness focused, and I want to be connected with the whole world. Um, there's an amazing book by Adam Kahane, Power and Love, uh, which says that power is the will to self-realize and love is the will to unite with the whole world. <laughs> and um, I think that, um, that we can never uh, achieve both at the same time. Hmm. Um, I will give you the literature for Adam Kahane. Yeah. Okay, so Ming, do you want to go ahead? Okay, so I'm Sue and uh, I'm working on a few different projects. I'm just uh, um, doing a large collection of articles for a special issue of Journal of International Women's Studies on being in the middle of decoloniality, which includes many embodied and uh, papers on embodied experiences and other kinds of ways of being in, in the middle of decoloniality. Um, and what could or should be included in that, including people's bodies, including performance, including art. And uh, also uh, just finishing off our own paper with Anik, who's also in this, uh, she's not here today, but um, she, uh, we draw on uh, for our own article, uh, some work on that she has done with dance and performance and trying to theorize that. So that's a little bit of a preface to who I am, because you did, Yoshka, you did ask us to uh, introduce ourselves also, yeah? Oh, also, I'm doing this kind of rather meta project, or two meta projects, which are really about how do we think about quality in the university now that the knowledge demands are different? And uh, uh, in another meta project with the African Critical University Studies Network, I'm involved in the uh, thinking about what the impact of universities is and how would we also think about impact in a decolonial way? What part does decoloniality play in understanding impact? So uh, my response to you, so thanks for uh, basically laying out lots and lots and lots of different ideas and feelings and experiences and ways of dealing with them and especially focusing on um, showing your vulnerability and the place of vulnerability in uh, research, in a research approach, in something that you might call social science uh, research. Yeah? And I'm interested in how we might redefine excellence and quality in research uh, in a way that can uh, include uh, ways of being, uh, uh, ways of being that are valid in themselves and have validity. Um, even though we cannot establish that they may have social scientific, uh, let's say, reliability, as in replicability or large scale uh, uh, data sets or something like that. But they have um, a value and a validity that's in and of themselves that we could say uh, helps us to redefine or understand what we mean by excellent research, good research, what is good. So uh, here's just a suggestion for you to think about it's not only to think about um, vulnerability, subjectivity, uh, and these questions that are hard to answer about the essence of your subjectivity and what it means to be uh, associated with a, a oppressor subjectivity, but what about thinking about ethics and relating your subjectivity to a narrative or a story, a methodology of integrity, and situating that story of integrity in a narrative of relationality that doesn't fall back on itself because it's not just about you your, and the world, which you might uh, characterize as oneness, but it's also about you and others, others who are you relating to. So having uh, interposing a category between you and oneness, yeah? Uh, you and the world, which is not 
um, as encompassing as oneness, but is more concrete in terms of the relationality and who you're relating to. So who are those uh, people in Janana Skriti? What are the projects? What are the their, their ethical situations and the situatedness. So you can do something maybe methodologically, uh, which would uh, build your research integrity and build a story about research integrity, which uh, would not be simply reduced down to uh, only an artistic performance or only your subjectivity, but would situate subjectivity and artistic uh, performance in relation to theory, theorizing, ethics, relationality, and, and a different sense of quality, relevance, and impact. So I think the, all these things are basically possible in rethinking social science. And they are, um, uh, to me, I think this is how we're going to decolonize social science by having a very concrete, very stepwise uh, approach to research integrity which is based on an ethics of decoloniality, uh, which is embedded in a thick and good description of relationality and how we are not, we are not simply related to the whole world, but we are relating to very specific kinds of contextualized others in that world. Sorry, very long, almost like a lecture, sorry, but yeah. Joshka, do you want to respond or should we just take it as a comment? Oh, you are... Maybe, maybe I can say a few words. I think it, um, there, will be never, there will never be a recipe for the research. So in each project, it might, it might uh, evolve about something else. And I think showing integrity as a researcher means that you have contextualized your own research in a way, aha, okay. This is how it looks in this project, and in this project, it might look in a, look totally different. Um, so I had very good discussions with, for example, anthropologists that said, "Yeah, but colonial re decolonial research means this and that for me." And I said, "Yes, it means that and that for you, and for me, it means this and that." And there will be no one recipe. This is maybe a comment. Um, there was a question in the chat uh, from Anna Marion. Um, who's wondering if multiple people from marginalized groups could work on some form of comparative autoethnography and how different those experiences could be from others from the same communities in the same time. Also, what other ways are there in which this experience can be expressed, particularly for societies where performing arts do not necessarily have a place of power? And you mentioned that also a little bit, no, in terms of you know what what validity does it um, does it have if it's just you know a play? Does it count as as research? Does it count as relevant knowledge? So there there are several questions in there. <laughs> Uh, maybe to, to 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 react a bit to that, I I have not included people doing comparative autoethnography in my work. Autoethnography is defined by using the body of the researcher that is researching, and um, and for me, relating also to what Sue said, it's more about uh, how we, can we uh, find an ethical. Uh, way of representing the other in the other ethnography because they are represented anyway, even if I don't mention them. Um, um, so, um, and, and I think um, this is only honest to say that I, I do this research from a certain um, um, from a certain position and acknowledging that from a other position it might be it might give you totally different results but some results that i'm i may find or 
what will, what will be written in my research might be useful for, for other positionalities. Yeah. I, so I'm against this, this notion of uh, he's white and male, and this is why he cannot say anything about this topic. <laughs> um, yes, I can say something about this topic, but I have to uh, um, do it from a certain positionality and, and reflect on that. And yeah, maybe also the bit about the um, performing arts. Uh, so it's just added that obviously in, in some places, especially in Europe, um, theater has a much more acknowledged or privileged place in, in society than in other parts. Mm -hmm. And I would say that uh, that theater, like Boal would say, the founder of Theater of Dress, that in Europe or Western cultures, theater has become a temple or it, it has been put, art has been put into a temple and it's called theater and theater is happening everywhere. <laughs> and and, um, and uh, yes, there are subsidies for theaters, but in, in the Western context, uh, but I would say uh, experience like MST or, or Jonathan's Critty Show, uh, uh, that this notion that it's a privileged space of theater in the Western world is maybe, uh, uh, not so, <laughs> not so uh, reliable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, if we are talking about development, of course, there is a whole theater for development debate, where is a lot of theater used to make colonizing education, and and how can theater best also intervene into this uh, problematic thing? So theater is everywhere, I think. Uh, okay, could you elaborate the purpose of the interest? Yeah, of course, uh, reflexi re reflexivity in positionality has become also a, a buzzword. And um, this is why I will not restrain myself to just say I am a white male and I, this is how I am and uh, la 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 la. But I will do much more and try to make an autoethnography, which is tracing this positionality throughout the whole research process and doesn't let it go at any point, hopefully. Uh, and then in a kind of universe, considering structure. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> uh, if did you all read the chat, we can't universalize the experience of theater considering the structural influences play a significant part in shaping the content that is displayed in, to various audiences. Yes, the people who make theater to oppress make topics of their everyday lives and they also have a positionality and it is position positionalized knowledge that they are pr presenting and uh, depending on whatever audience you show the thing that you have produced it might may uh, produce very different uh, results uh, for example we have played uh, here in vienna a play on care work of the elderly and uh, we have performed it for a very feminist audience in, in Vienna in the, in the university. And we've also mm -hmm. performed it in a rural, uh, several generation uh, village. And of course, the, the effectiveness of the people was very different to the same content. Yeah. And how you can join Resident Revolt Network? That is a very nice question. Uh, yes, uh, we love theater groups who want to join, who, who do theater on theater, political theater on climate justice. And at the moment we are in uh, UK, Germany, Slovenia, and Austria. Um, and and uh, we are trying to expand the network, of course. And um, just join us, just write me an email. <laughs> yeah, you would have it. Are there any more burning, burning issues, burning questions? I was uh, maybe one more question for me. I was wondering um, because you outlined it, um, you know, so so vividly in terms of how um, how your drive as an activist or how your motivation um, also fuels itself in, in, in some way of 
not feeling helpless in face of um, the current climate crisis or uh, lots of other um, op oppressions, injustices, etc. Um, but I was wondering of all, you know, kind of um, tools or instruments or approaches or whatever, also among all of them that you have laid out, why would um, a PhD be part of it? Because I mean, the I mean, you out. You of course you said you know it wouldn't be um, you just you writing the book and etc. You would try and co-author. You would try to give um, space to lots of other voices. Um, but in the end, it it will be you who submits um, a PhD to a university. Yeah. So. Um, I mean, you could, assumedly, you could do all of these things without writing the PhD, no? Um, yes. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I, yeah, I'm, yeah, just, yeah. I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, one thing is definitely that the university gives me the material security okay. uh, by giving me a grant to write a thing. And I can just do all the things that I normally would do and get paid for it. Uh, that is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so. But suppose it also gives you restrictions in terms of what what is valid knowledge and how it has to be submitted and in what form and in you know the required length and the required uh, number yeah. of words and the required so and so. Yeah, I mean, I also love doing it. I love do. I love writing. I love uh, academic writing, and I think I I I, I like academic writing actually the best. <laughs> um, um, And I love knowledge or reading for reading's sake <laughs> and writing for writing's sake. Um, and I think that I think knowledge beyond the PhD. So for example, we have produced a toolkit of theater methods for climate justice with a resilient reward network that you can use and it's open source. So any activist can take it. Mm. Yeah, so. Yeah, which is, you know, because yeah, academic knowledge is useful, some yeah. kind of privilege knowledge in opposition to open source knowledge, toolboxes, toolkits, things that can be appropriate, that can be changed, that can be further developed. Um, this piece of academic writing is some kind of... Is one part of a bigger action. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's one hand. How much is it difficult yeah, to change to... the right wing politics through the art by activists? Hmm. Hmm. I know one project in Eastern Germany where they try to go into dialogue with people who are voting right-wing populists but they think that they are not lost forever <laughs> so they make the foreign theater and they they show different sides of politics being at the side of the left somehow but also seeing some sense in the concerns of the right-wing people um, and i think that for example jana sanskriti in india has big problems facing right-wing Hindu nationalist politics right now. Um, but what they're trying to do is making uh, uh, events for uh, uh, like peace events or Hindu Muslim friendship gatherings, this kind of thing that uh, they don't uh, just submit to the politics of difference. Yeah. Okay. Looking, yeah, looking at the, yeah. And unfortunately, we won't be able to, you know, solve all the questions now. <laughs> Especially questions like these are really, really broad. Um, looking at the time, I was, I would um, say, if there are any still any burning questions, please um, come forward. <laughs> Otherwise, I would suggest um we wrap up um i'm sure Yoshka will be happy to interact um via email or individually
individually, bilaterally, um, if there are still any any questions or any follow-up comments. So um, you can simply write to me um, and I will be happy to connect you. Um, apart from that, thank you very much, uh, Joschka, for sharing your research, your insights, um, and also your enthusiasm. Um, much appreciated. And thanks uh, to all of you for joining us. Um, and hope to see many of you again. Um, and hope to keep in touch and keep the, the conversation going, the dialogue going, um, and also the, I guess, the action. So thanks very much um, and uh, see you again all soon. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julia, for your work. It's amazing. Bye. <laughs> Bye.